I think we can now continue our journey out of this world with our next speaker, uh, Kiri Wagstaff. Kiri is a researcher at the JPL um, Machine Learning and Instrument Autonomy Group. And she's also an associate research professor at Oregon State University. So Kiri, all yours. All right, thanks very much. Thanks everybody for being here and thanks for this chance to talk about some of our work in explainable AI as well. I think this is a great segue from what she's just shared. Uh, we're gonna move from the realm of astronomy into planetary science for this talk. And there've been a lot of contributors to this work. I'm highlighting a few here um, with Ben Bornstein, Gary Doran, Tara Eslin, Dan Gaines, and Jake Lee. And what I'd like to cover today is a discussion of the role of explanations in discovery. And I'll talk about two scenarios, first in a supervised setting and then in an unsupervised setting. So here we're talking first about discovery on the surface of Mars and enabled by our robotic spacecraft that are there on the surface. And in this sense, I characterize this as supervised in the sense that we are able to articulate what are interesting rock targets that we like to find on the surface if and when the rover encounters them, but not supervised in the sense that we're able to hover and tell it what to do, because this, um, this system is operating 200 million miles away. And so that's where the call for autonomy and the ability to analyze data autonomously is needed. So this is the Aegis system that's been in operation on the Mars Science Laboratory rover since 2016. It has the capability to, at the end of a drive to a new location, the rover looks around at the scene that it's currently in, identifies all possible rock targets within seven meters, and then ranks them against previously stated science priorities of the mission for the one that best matches what we like to study in more depth and then autonomously fires the ChemCam laser spectrometer at that target to collect a spectrum that indicates which elements are present within that sample. And this happens entirely um, automatically, no human in the loop. This data is collected and is sent back down to Earth for review and to inform planning for the next day. So in a little more detail how this works is that the rover again, drives to a new location. At the end of the drive, it takes a series of images that will help plan the next steps of exploration. And here's just an example of one navigational camera or navcam image. Um, the, the rover then identifies where are all of the rock objects within the scene. And then for each one extracts a, a set of features that describe those targets in terms of their intensity, sh size, shape, how far away they are and so on. And then it filters out targets that are too small to be useful, too far away and so on, to only reserve those that are good candidates for the ChemCam instrument. And then within that set, ranks them against, again, those stated science priorities. So those are variable. They can be changed by this, the planning team as needed. They might be um, a statement such as, I like to find uh, rocks that are really large and, and angular or small and dark, um, just very basic properties that the rover is able to compute on its own. And then whichever one is selected as the top ranked target, uh, the, the rover is able to determine the center position and then fire the ChemCam laser to collect that spectrum representing the contents of the target. And this can actually iterate if time and resources permit to get the next and the next and the next target on the list, although primarily it's only one or two that, that actually get collected. So this is the decision setting that we're in. Uh, we have an autonomous system that's going to choose what the observing target will be. Um, and so for the context of our discussion today, a, a key question is, how does this get explained? So if the rover is autonomously choosing our targets for us, then um, why did it pick what it did? So for us to understand this back on Earth, uh, the key here is to be able to recreate that decision setting so we know the full scope of candidates that were considered and were able to follow along with the decisions that were made. So it's not just sending back that spectrum that came from the top chosen target, but instead you really need the NavCam image to show where all the targets were. You need the locations of each of the ones that were considered um, before and after the filtering I mentioned that removes the really small or, or too distant targets and so on. 
You also need to know what the features were that were computed for each target, and then that final ranking. And if you have all of those pieces, then you can understand a decision that was made by the system. So let's see, here's one example. Um, so this is a NADCAM scene and, and each colored area is a different target and it's okay if you can't really read the numbers, but they're each labeled and identified for our use and in inspection on the earth. And you can plot over here on the right, all of every single one of those candidate targets by its size. Here we've got radius on the x-axis and its average intensity or brightness. And um, then you can see these red lines that are showing where we're filtering out the really small ones, or in this case, the ones that are, are too dark that don't satisfy the science priorities. And you, you have a smaller set of candidates that pass that filter. Those are the ones that move into the ranking step at the bottom. And in this case, the stated objectives were prioritizing large area and high intensity, although again, you could express different priorities. So highlighted in blue are the top three candidates by that stated set of priorities, and they correspond to three particular targets that are visible in the scene. But now we have the context and we can see um, those three were chosen, but here are all the other ones that were not chosen, and we can better understand why they did not why they were not chosen. And by the way, I am watching the, the Q&A. So if you have questions while I'm speaking, feel free to put them there. And I hope that I can weave that into the presentation here. So the great thing is that not only do we then understand what the rover did and why, but it can allow us to refine our science priorities if we decide, well, it did exactly what we told it to do, but uh, it missed out on something that we need, now need to respond to. Maybe we've driven into a new area where there aren't very many large, bright targets, and we have we're, we're now want to look for, say, meteorites, which tend to be much, much darker, but also of great scientific interest. So we can look at these distributions and decide if we want to modify the stated priorities for the system. Over time, the use of the system has increased the use of the instrument itself, which is kind of cool. You can see here before the system was deployed there was kind of an average of 255 shots made by the ChemCam instruments, each shot collecting a spectrum per mission day or SOL. Um, after this was deployed, a, lot, uh, a relatively larger amount of data is actually being collected by this instrument because it's able to autonomously get there before we can anticipate some of those science needs and collect the data um, and send it back. So this is great news. It's, it's made the instrument more productive and it's given people more direct control over what, uh, what data should be collected in advance. That's the first example I wanted to show um, in this world of planetary science exploration. The second one is moving into the unsupervised realm where we no longer have a, an explicit statement of what we're looking for, but we have a whole lot of data and we'd like to find what's interesting within it. And this comes up all the time, of course, in large, uh, large image data sets. The um, planetary, data science, planetary data systems imaging node, which is where all of the planetary missions send their images for archival, uh, has over a petabyte now of image data, and it's, it's just this enormous embarrassment of riches. And so we like to have the ability to sort through all this data and find what may be interesting or new. One strategy for doing this, and some of you have heard me talk about this algorithm before, I'm just using it as one example here, is um, the DMUD algorithm that uses a singular value decomposition to model data that is incrementally selected from a larger set. And what this does is it, 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 it builds a growing model of what you as the user or recipient of these selections, what you know about this data set. You may start out knowing nothing, and it picks out one image and gives that to you. And it retains a model of that image. And then it will go and choose the thing that is most different from what you already know according to its model. So it'll pick something very different in, in this case, color and shape. And now you've seen two examples and it keeps this sort of simplified model that unifies their properties together and allows it to go and hunt for something that's very different from both of them, which might be this third object that's now an even different color and shape. And under the hood, it's using a sync value decomposition to model that um, observed data set. Not the entire petabyte of data, but just the ones that you've already seen. It's trying to model your knowledge and find new information within the larger data set. 
And the way it ranks items for picking them out and showing them to you is reconstruction error. So using, I'm not gonna go into the math details here, but using this uh, learned model, you can try to model every single item within the larger data set and highlight those that cannot be readily modeled or explained by what has already been seen. For working with images, we need a feature representation to do that singular value decomposition. And so we've leveraged a neural network as a feature extractor in this case. So this, I'm showing you a picture of AlexNet. It's, you could use any neural network here where you feed in your images through the learned um, neural network, but instead of getting out your class probabilities from the classifier, you pull out the, the internal latent representation that's been learned, which should be customized to the content in the data set that's, that's used in that case. And then we use those features as the input representation to the DMIT algorithm. So the way that works is we have our, in this case, it's a 4,096 valued feature vector, goes into the algorithm um, and picks out some image and says, this is different and interesting. And of course, DMIT is not really seeing the image itself. Again, it's only getting these 4,096 features, which is a sparse representation of the pixels, which I'm showing you here. And so if we want to see what the algorithm is actually seeing, um, we use a, a feature inversion method that, that tries to go from this internal latent space back into the feature space and represent the image content in terms of what the algorithm is really working with. And you can see it's capturing actually a lot of the detail. But that's what we need to think about in terms of what the algorithm is really operating on, since we're not speeding at all of the pixels. But the question is, it pulls out an image and says this is interesting, but why? Um, what made that image get scored really high in terms of uh, DMUD's assessment? Well, um, we need to think about what it means to have an explanation for discovery in this setting. And I want to just make a point that, again, this is unsupervised. We don't have a right answer. But arguably, explanations are really only meaningful then if you consider the context from which they were generated. So if we picked out this image from this um, set of five images, and I were a human, and which I am, I might come up with an explanation that says something like, well, this is interesting because it's very yellow, and I don't really see that in these other images. Or because it has no grass, and all of the other four have grass present. You know, I can come up with a, an explanation that's relative to what was not chosen. But in a different context, the exact same image should really get a different explanation, right? Um, the fact that it's yellow is no longer salient. Everything's yellow in this data set. Um, grass is not even a feature here, so we wouldn't really talk about that. Instead, we would need to focus on discriminating features like it has petals, it's a flower, you know, it has this dark central feature, even you might zero in on that. So with that in mind, the way we've been generating explanations for DMUD's selections of images <clears throat> likewise relies on what was already seen. So we have a data set here and it already saw some yellow flowers and some citrus fruit and it picked up this um, daisy. Why did it do that? Well, the explanation is really composed of two things. because We're separating out what it was able to successfully reconstruct or what it thought was already present and what, um, what failed to be reconstructed. So if DMUD has only seen two images ever, its best reconstruction of given this latent space vector is gonna look like this. It looks like it's building on something from each of the ones it's seen before, but obviously it's not a very good reconstruction of the daisy. And that's because it's literally only seen two examples in its entire experience of this data set. Um, but it's it's trying, you know, it's reproduced some of the same color um, and it's filled in, it, it doesn't have white gaps like these, it's trying to fill in and be closer to that. Um, but it's able to also visualize for us what failed. And we see that the part that it could not re uh, reconstruct is not the color, it, it really got the color pretty well. So the color has vanished from this part of the explanation. But the, the texture and the central dark feature are still very present. Those were things it could not reconstruct. And that becomes the explanation for why it thinks this is novel. It's never seen something with these radial features and the dark central area in the items already shown. 
So that was just working with you know kind of earth images. But the question is, can we apply the same capability or approach to um, to our exploration of Mars? So we compiled a data set from the Mars Science Laboratory rover, the three different instruments that are categorized in to, into 25 different classes, um, different parts of the rover, different you know ground horizon views, and so on. And those are categorized by us in terms of inspecting the data, but they're not given to the um, to the algorithm, which we are hoping can demonstrate the ability to discover those new classes very quickly. So if we give it 6,700 images, it should hopefully find those 25 images as quickly as possible and present them to us as a discovery result. But one key question is that the, the feature extractor we're using, the standard ImageNet extractor, was trained on Earth images. And does it generalize enough to capture salient content within our, our Mars data set is, is a good question. So I wanted to give you a sense of what that data looks like. This is um, a random, completely random sampling within the data set. So you can see that it, it does span a lot of different types of images. And if we run this um, data set through DMUD, then it turns out that the first top 10 selections we get out are very heterogeneous, which is exactly what we're hoping. It's highlighting, this is um, actually another rover instrument right here. Um, it's highlighting different parts of the rover. It's highlighting some different terrain, parts of the wheels and so on. And if we look at the very bottom of that 6,000 item ranking, we can see a lot of homogeneity, right? So this is where everything kind of ended up together. It is, at that point, it's able to reconstruct them very well because it's seen really, a, it's seen a, uh, the full diversity that the data set has to offer at that point. So it does seem to be doing something reasonable in terms of ranking. And then the question is, what does it do in terms of explanations? So I'm going to highlight an example here for you. This is um, one of the selections made, which this is another instrument on the rover. Um, this is the REMS UV instrument. And um, again, our goal is that at every selection, the best performance would be for the algorithm to discover a new class. And so we noticed that with selection 13, we got this image. And a question, if you're mining through this data set, the question you have is, is this a new class? Um, and I think without knowing much about the rover, it's pretty hard to say. Like, it looks a lot like the one we've seen before, but does the rover have two of these on its body, one that's white and one that's kind of red? Or is it the same one? Uh, and it would be the same class, but its appearance has changed. And I've given you a clue at the bottom that uh, the first one was taken early on in the mission, mission day 36, the second one at mission day 808, and we know that there's a lot of dust deposition and certainly that's what's happening here. So it's really, it's exactly the same object, but its appearance has changed due to environmental conditions. And I think this is um, a nice example of what Anima was talking about earlier with the covariate shift problem. So if you trained a classifier, for example, using data early in the mission, you might never recognize that this is actually the same thing because its appearance has shifted even though its identity has not. So this is a real problem that happens in the data. And since you're never gonna have a fully comprehensive pre-labeled data set, you really do have to be aware of changes that can happen. But in this unsupervised setting, we don't have the classes predefined, we're trying to discover them. And so the question is, again, is this new? I'm telling you it's not, how would we know that? Well, the explanation that, that is generated by the system, again, divides into what it's able to reconstruct from the, from the latent space representation of this image, which is a little bit abstract art here, but it clearly, it, it seems to be trying to reconstruct it as this object. It's got the white face with the black um, circles on it, even if the positions are a little off. And the part that it says I can't reconstruct is exactly the, the color, the dust, right? So this kind of looks like you've scrubbed all the dust off of that object and you've left the dust over here. If you look closely, it's not just the dust that's changed. It is also the round circles here. They're kind of in shadow in this view, but they're reflecting a lot of light in the second view. And that gets highlighted here as well with these bright, um, bright circles instead of dark ones. So it's really, it's really trying to tell us what's different about this image. And then it really requires the human to look at that and say, 
yeah, you recognize it's the same object, it's just dirty, or no, it's it's a, actually a different one if we knew that there were two on the rover or some other external knowledge. So I will wrap up there because questions are always good and um, just summarize with a message that explanations are really important for planetary science discovery. Uh, I believe they can actually play a huge role in increasing mission acceptance of new capabilities and autonomy that greatly increase our capabilities when we're operating remotely. And what we described here were two scenarios. One was a super supervised setting where you want to explain why it picked out an object. And the second one, an unsupervised setting where you want to understand why it thinks it's a new kind of object. And in both cases, I think the key is that you have to be able to incorporate the decision or discovery context so that your explanation remains meaningful in that application. So thank you for your attention and we'll go to questions. Well, thank you, Kiri. And since you encourage questions, there is one already. Laura is asking how you quantify how much is new. That's a really great, uh, great question. If I go back here. Um, when we're at this stage, um, technically the, the information that's considered new is also within a 4096 vector. It's literally the reconstruction error between what the system reconstructed in, in 4096 feature space, the numeric difference between that and what it should have been. Um, but that is like um, a vector of pluses and, and like real valued numbers that are plus or minus, and they're not comprehensible. And that's why we try to distill this into a visualization. So we have a quantification in the latent space, and that's how we how we numerically rank the different images for their, you know, which one is most novel. But this is how we understand what's there. Once we move into the explanation world, there is no longer a quantification associated with it. That's a that's fairly very meaningful. So that's a challenge. And there is a follow-up question. I see that. How does that inform the decision between whether it's new or existing? Um, to be honest, so the way this should this, the way this should work is that the ranked list is is kind of guiding you in a qualitative sense. So the most unusual things will occur first. And actually, if you go down that list far enough, you will start to repeat. You'll exhaust all twenty five classes at some point, and you'll start to get repeats. Um, but for things like what I showed here. Truly, this, this takes external knowledge to answer the question that's in red um, about whether it's new object class. The algorithm wasn't given the sol number as a feature, so it can't really reason about time. And it doesn't know anything about which instruments are on board this spacecraft, so what to expect in terms of duplicity. So what we're hoping is it may still take a human to make that decision, but that the explanation can provide the, the key pieces needed to, to get there and combine it with your, your contextual domain knowledge. Thank you. Um, you do speak fast, so we're way ahead of our <laughs> schedule, uh, which is an uncommon experience in conferences, as we all know. Um, yeah, you also let me get started a little early, so um, thanks to Ashish as well. Yeah. 